On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I'm delighted to moderate this evening's program, and it is with my great pleasure that I get to introduce our guest tonight, Dr. Helene Gale. Helene Gale joined Care USA as president and CEO in 2006. Previously, she served as AIDS coordinator and chief of the HIV AIDS division for the U.S. Agency for International Development. She was also the director for the CDC's National Center for HIV, STD, and TB Prevention. She was the director of the CDC Washington office and a health consultant to international organizations, including the World Health Organization, UNICEF, the World Bank, and UNAIDS. Prior to her current position, she was the director of the HIV, TB, and Reproductive Health Program for the Bill and Melinda Gates Program Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gale for a conversation uh, about CARE's work around the world and the importance of empowering women in the fight against extreme poverty. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gale. So let me start. Many of us know that, um, broadly speaking, that CARE is a humanitarian organization, uh, but your work is in many different sectors, um, reaching the entire globe. Can you just tell us a bit about CARE, uh, you know, how it started, and how your mission has evolved over time? Great, and first let me say thanks uh, to you and to the World Affairs Council. It's a wonderful opportunity. I always love when I get a chance to come out to San Francisco and this is such a wonderful forum to bring people together to talk about uh, key global issues. Um, so a little bit about CARE. Um, you know, we're an organization that's been around for about 70 years, started out um, providing relief to countries and people in war-torn Europe after World War II. So we started a care package and, and gave out uh, basic supplies and, and um, you know, key things that people had uh, who were in the process of rebuilding their lives. And so our roots really began in providing emergency relief and helping to um, help people um, you know, with water, food, shelter, clothing, and, and, and essential needs. And obviously, after um, Europe was re rebuilt, we moved on. And so we've become an organization that focuses on um, providing support to the poorest communities around the world, and have really moved from providing basic needs to looking at how do we help communities um, in poor communities around the world develop their own capacity so that hopefully um, communities will be able to do what they need to do to fight poverty on their own and to really go beyond just looking at basic needs, but looking at what are some of the underlying and root causes that um, keep people mired in poverty around the world. We're in about 86 countries around the world, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Um, and, you know, looking at everything, you know, comprehensive issues of access to health, access mm -hmm. to economic opportunities, education, and, and um, all of those uh, basic needs. But again, with the idea of how do you do that in a way that helped to build capacity within those countries so that, you know, what we're leaving behind are communities that are much more enabled and where we can have impact that lasts beyond uh, just giving basic commodities to people, but really giving people skills and capacity to change their lives in the long run. Mm. And you know, 70 years ago, I guess, uh, when CARE was founded to today, I mean, the, the number of international non-governmental organizations um, has just exploded. And you know, my question is, what makes CARE unique amongst all those actors? and how you guys have been able to sort of stand the test of time? Well, you know, I think like any organization, you've got to look at what are the challenges for, for today, how do you adapt your organization so that you're relevant for the needs of today, and how do you continue to evolve um, in ways that, that keep you relevant? And so, you know, for us it has meant, um, again, moving from this notion of 
you know, giving people, you know, in the, in the parable of, you know, teaching people right. to fish, to uh, giving people fish, to teaching them to fish, to really making sure that they're fish in the stream. So we also look at what are the factors that, um, you know, really are those underlying root causes that are the reason why people find themselves in poverty. We also have looked a lot more at how do you not only do programs well, but how do you take those learnings and then use those to shift policy? So we're very involved in policy and advocacy work, and we've got some of our advocates here in the audience who help us to be the voice for the voiceless here in our country and to make sure that people remember how important it is for us to also be um, making sure that people in this country recognize why it's important for us to um, work not just in, to solve problems here, but how globally interconnected we are and why it matters for us to, to be involved globally. So I think it's those kinds of things. And you know, we're also looking at very different ways of doing our work. Do it, we're doing a lot more with the private sector, for instance. While we're a non-governmental organization, we recognize that by having different kinds of partners, we can actually extend the kind of work that we do. So we work with corporations who are looking at how they can create um, not only generating economic value, but recognizing that economic value can also be an engine for social change. So we're doing a lot more work also looking at private sector approaches in the work that we do and doing a lot more that's um, enabled by technology. So I think there are lots of ways in which we're trying to look at how do you take our basic mission, but do it in a way that partners smarter, um, partners with organizations that bring things to the table that we don't have, looking at how the role of technology, uh, looking at how we continue to think about building others' capacity, and all of those are the kinds of things that we think are important to keep us um, true to our mission, but also evolving as time goes on. Great. You touched on a lot of areas that I'm, I'm going to get into a little later in the discussion. But right now, I mean, I've read that, you know, CARE has this major emphasis or focus on girls and women and um, empowering girls and women as a force for social change. And so, you know, my question to you now is why does CARE focus um, on women in particular in the fight uh, to, to help fight poverty in households, in local communities, and across the globe? Well, you know, we've really um, evolved over the last few years, and, you know, if we step back and look at our work um, and thinking about what are some of the factors that are um, obstacles to progress in the communities that we work in, and one of those that we recognized was a real obstacle was gender inequality. And if you look at um, the statistics on poverty, girls and women are disproportionately impacted by poverty uh, around the globe. So, you know, I'm an epidemiologist. You think about where do you go, go where the numbers are. So clearly, if you were to just, just say where's the burden of poverty, um, the greatest numbers of people living in poverty are girls and women. So if you're an organization that focuses on poverty, you go where the numbers are. But beyond that, you know, we also realize that, you know, if you can educate a girl, that's creating change that goes well beyond her. That girl will get married later. She'll have fewer children. Her children will be more likely to go to school. She's more likely to earn an income. Uh, she's more likely to, to have a more equal relationship with her partner. And all of those things start changing the dynamics within the family, the dynamics in the community. And that's where we see a, we can have some of the most catalytic change that doesn't just impact girls and women, but it really is what brings balance um, in, into whole societies. And so it's how do you bring that other equation that has been so left out of so many societies so that the, the communities that we work in have the advantage of having both men and women at the table bringing what they have to bring to, to really create stronger and more healthy societies and, and economies? So, I mean, you know, here in this country, we still have women who don't earn as much as men are earning. Um, so in the countries where you are working in very traditional societies, can you talk about some of the pushback or the resistance that you've faced and how you've overcome those obstacles? Yeah, you know, and, and in the countries that we're in, 
um, you know, we don't come in with a cookie cutter approach. Mm -hmm. We work with the communities to find practical solutions that meet their community norms and their community standards. And, you know, in, the, in, in our countries, you know, we have um, most of our staff come from those countries. So they understand the country co context mm -hmm. and can help to think about how do you adapt things um, that, that uh, gets the buy-in in, in communities. And so, you know, we work with, with local communities, work with local leaders. You know, I can give an example, um, you know, in, in Afghanistan during the years of the Taliban, when it was actually illegal to educate a girl. Well, because our, our uh, schools and, and, and educational um, activities were really owned by those communities, we had worked with them, they believed in it, they started to understand why it made a difference to educate their girls. So they, they came up with the solution that, okay, we can't, we can't uh, say that we're sending our girls to school, so let's call them sewing schools. It's okay to teach girls to sew, and we were still teaching them to read and write, but they figured out how to, how to give cover to educating girls. And so I think you know, it's just a creative example of how when you work with communities and when you help them to understand the value of something like educating a girl, they help you to find the solutions to cut through those cultural barriers themselves. And so while you have this focus on women and girls, what does that mean in terms of um, how care interacts with men and boys? Well, it means that, that, that men and boys have to be a, a critical part of the equation. You know, we started out, like so many organizations, thinking, all right, if we're about empowering girls and women, then we put the focus on helping women see the difference uh, having women understand their own value. But we found that if you, if you only focus on women, yes, you can have a difference in the way a woman feels about herself or what, how a girl feels about herself. But if you then put her back in the same environment, in some ways you haven't really done her a favor. She's still surrounded by people who don't understand um, you know, the value that they bring and, and and their ability to impact their environment hasn't really changed. So we recognize that if we're gonna think about changing the lives of girls and, and, and women, that you also have to change the way that men and boys view girls and women. So we also have a lot of focus on how to engage boys and men in helping to empower girls and women so that you're really bringing both party, parties to the table. And you know, you can go into, uh, I, I think about some of the programs that we have with um, village savings and loans, programs where uh, women pool their resources together, save so that they can give each other loans and then start businesses, et cetera. And at first, um, the men were very resistant because they weren't used to their wives having, having uh, resources and having businesses and, and being uh, starting to have some in, uh, economic independence. But when we worked with the men, they started realizing, well, you know, it's actually good. They're bringing resources into the family. My children now can go to school. They can eat. Um, I now start to see my wife as a valued partner. She's no longer a burden to me. She's somebody who actually brings value to the family. So I think it's in working with both sides that we see that we really get the, the real benefit out of empowering girls and women. That's great. So, you know, you touched upon how um, having gender equity in the home contributes to economic development. Can you talk about what gender equity in educational settings does to um, the role that it plays in economic development in the countries you work in? Well, it's just so fundamental. You know, I think all of us uh, who have had the opportunity to have an education, we recognize what that does for um, our future opportunities, our future potential, our sense of ourselves. Uh, you know, we were just talking about some of the work that, that you do and how important it is for girls to understand the different options and opportunities they have. So I think, you know, in many ways, education is that, um, is that key to unlocking people's future potential. Um, there's a wonderful program that I visited not long ago in India that takes girls who are street children off of the street, you know, girls who oftentimes have had absolutely no opportunity for access to education, 
and it, and it, it gives them catch-up education so that a 14-year-old girl doesn't, who's never had any education doesn't have to go and sit in a classroom with a five-year-old or a six-year-old uh, and be embarrassed by being the oldest child there. She gets, the, uh, she gets a very intensive period of education that catches her up so that she can then go to school with same-aged um, classmates in a year or two. And it just transforms their lives. These are girls who otherwise had no sense of, of hope for the future who now are able to um, you know, get mainstreamed into educational opportunities and feel a totally different sense of what uh, the future lies for themselves. So I just think it's, it's core and, and really fundamental. Great. And uh, looking at economic empowerment, we've heard uh, about your work with women and girls. What about men and boys? How are they um, brought into the economic empowerment development process? Yeah, well, you know, again, I think it is, it just, it's critical that, that in our work we make sure that boys and men are getting a different sense of their selves in relationship to, um, you know, their daughters, their wives, their mothers, because that's where we're going to see community change actually, um, actually occur. Uh, I think it, you know, I think it's core and it's fundamental. So we do a lot of work with engaging men, um, groups. You know, when we first started doing women's empowerment groups, we would talk to men in the community, and they say, "Well, you know, we want a group like that too, because we've got issues we need to talk about." And so we're doing that more, making sure that we're also thinking about how do we have shape the way men view women in society, um, so that we're really creating that balance across the board. Eliminating poverty, it's a very noble goal. <laughs> and, but the scale of the problem really does seem overwhelming. Do you really think that eliminating poverty is something that can be accomplished? Yeah, I have no doubt. I think um, we can eliminate extreme poverty um, in, you know, in our lifetime. I think, you know, um, the World Bank has a goal of eliminating extreme poverty by the year 2030. You know, I think that that's totally feasible. You know, can I stop you for the audience, a definition of extreme poverty? Extreme poverty, when we talk about extreme poverty, is people living on less than a dollar and 25 cents a day. You know, I you know I think there's it's it's probably it's probably realistic that there will always be some sort of inequity. You know, I think the world, um, you know, there will be different stratas. But when we talk about eliminating poverty, we're saying you know people who have who go to bed every night hungry, who don't have access to clean and safe drinking water, who don't have basic access to basic. Um, you know, life necessities. I think that's where we think we can eliminate extreme poverty, people living at uh, below what is necessary for a, a reasonable um, life um, existence is what we think is possible. We know what it takes. I think there's more will than ever before. Um, and I think if we put the right resources and the right programs and the right policies together, it's achievable. But I think it's important that we do it in a way that brings um, not only NGOs like CARE to the table, but governments, private sector. It's going to take all of us if we're going to have that kind of impact. And uh, can you expand on that a little bit? I mean, talk about some of the innovation that CARE is leading the charge that's moving the needle on eliminating extreme poverty. Yeah, well, you know, I think, um, as I said in some of the earlier comments, you know, we're doing a lot of things that I think are really um, helping, to, hel helping to go from just aid to longer-term impact. And, you know, it's building capacity at the local level. It's working with partners on the ground so that what we're doing is not perpetuating a dependency, but actually helping people to, to build their own self-sufficiency. It's working with governments so that governments within the countries are prioritizing the things that help to uh, provide basic needs for, for people and that can, that can be replicated. It's taking what we know works and making sure that it can be scaled up by working with, with governments, by working with other NGOs, by working with the private sector. And it's looking at different kinds of models that, um, you know, in the case of things like creating social businesses where 
people are creating businesses that give them sustainable income streams versus just working with grants that run out after two or three years. So I think it's looking at all of those sort of things um, in ways that build more sustainable solutions for the future. And from the work that CARE has done globally for decades now, um, let's apply some of the lessons learned abroad here at home. And I just want to ask you if you can you know, help the audience understand what CARE's work abroad and around the world means for us here at home. Well, I think you know, um, having kind of worked both domestically and internationally um, throughout my career, I think there's a lot of things that we actually do better internationally that could be brought home. You know, I think the fact that we do a lot more to put communities at the center of our work and work a lot more to help communities to solve their own, uh, come up with solutions for their own uh, problems. You know, I think the, the focus on um, making sure that gender is included in the way that we look at work because I think we still have um, challenges here in our own country around how we make sure that girls and women have equal opportunity, um, you know, not only to education but to, to access to, to um, uh, occupational and, and career opportunities, mm -hmm. how we break down some of those barriers. So I think there are a lot of things like, like that, that, that and how we integrate um, uh, our work so that we're not seeing things in stovepipes because people, after all, are, are integrated. They don't just think about their health uh, separate from their education, separate from their, you know, uh, the food they eat, all of that is is very much integrated. And so I think the way we work in development is much more integrated sometimes than the way we work here in our own country. Interesting. And, you know, I'm sure you're asked all the time, you know, why should Americans care about your work or global poverty when we do have, as you say, so many serious problems with uh, poverty, health, education, and the economy right here in the U.S. I mean, what do you say to them? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think there's uh, at least three reasons. Um, and I'll start with the ones that I think are the least important. But, okay. you know, um, uh, but we, people talk all the time about how it's in our economic interest. And I think it is. I mean, I think, you know, if we think about um, having strong trading partners, um, uh, whether we think about, the, we look at the economic crisis and realize that that became a global crisis because we have globally interconnected economies. And, you know, if one economy is, is down, it drags on the whole global economy. So, you know, it's for our own economic prosperity. It makes, it makes a big difference to have um, countries around the world that are also economically prosperous. Um, it makes a difference for our national security. We know that in countries where people are um, desperately poor, they are more likely to become targets for un unsafe and unwise policies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so it, it has national security interests. But I think you know the number one reason is because we're good people, and it's part of who we are. Um, Americans have always been generous. It's the roots of our organization with the care package. Uh, you know, one day we're enemies, the next day we're sending food to people uh, because, because we care and because we're generous. And I think, you know, we um, as, a, as a nation of people who are kind, humane, it's part of our humanity and I think it's the right thing to do. And I think um, you can think about self-interest issues, but I think at the end of the day it's because it's the right thing to do. I like that. It is the right thing to do. Um, CARE does a lot of work on advocacy and public policy. And, you know, I'm sure you're asked, why does CARE get involved in politics? But, you know, what do you tell people? What are some of the biggest issues on the advocacy front that CARE is tackling? Yeah, and um, who are some of our advocates in the audience? Raise your hands. We have a, we have a very active network of... Um, <laughs> what we call our Care Action Network, and it's a hundred and, uh, well, I guess a, a couple hundred thousand advocates around the, around the um, country now who go and talk to policymakers. I know several people in the audience were talking to some of the 
Congress people and senators here in this area, but to, to talk about policies that affect the poor around the world. Because, you know, we've, we've got people all the time talking about different issues, but very few people who remind our policymakers that it makes a difference for, the, for Americans to continue to be generous uh, around these issues. You know, every time there's a budget debate, the foreign assistance budget is one of the first ones that people start talking about. So first and foremost, you know, one of the things that we want to remind policymakers that it does make a difference to continue to be generous um, as America. You know, people, um, you know, all think that we spend a huge amount of money on, on foreign assistance. And if you do surveys, people think that we spend somewhere like 25% of our budget on foreign assistance. Not and if you ask all. people how much would you be willing to spend, they say something like, well, maybe about 10%, but we spend less than 1%. And so, you know, for that little bit of money, relatively speaking, we get a, a, a lot of bang for the buck uh, in terms of making a difference in people's lives. So that's one of the big issues we focus on. But we also focus on um, key issues around women like um, gender-based violence. There's a major piece of legislation that we have been trying to push uh, along with others around uh, policies around gender-based violence around the world or um, funding girls' education around the world or looking at, at, at other issues that uh, particularly affect women. Food security, we're an organization whose roots are all about uh, providing food. So the issue of making sure that there's adequate resources um, for agriculture, nutrition support is a big is an, another one of the big issues. So you know we're really focused on some of the key policy issues that we think make a big difference for people around the world. But first and foremost, making sure that policymakers remember that it is important for Americans to continue to be generous, and um, you know that little bit of money that we send makes a big difference to um, people all over the world. And what are ways that people can get engaged in CARE's work? What well, kind of like, well, one is around advocacy. You know, um, uh, we, again, we have this large network of people, and uh, we can, people here from our CARE Action Network are, uh, raise your hand, they can come and see you. We sign up on our, on our web. And, you know, it's a really wonderful way, writing letters to Congress people, letting them know um, why it matters for us to continue to think about these issues. But also, um, you know, we always uh, are happy to have people do things that support our mission, that help us to raise resources, help us to raise awareness about these issues around the world. So, you know, I think there's a lot of ways that people can get involved. Great. Um, we have quite a few questions. <laughs> From the audience. So let's start with this right. question. It's how does CARE measure its success and impact? And have you transitioned communities from recipients of aid uh, to empowering them to, um, you know, fight poverty in their own way? It's a long question. And how, how do you, um, how do communities fare after CARE's influence wanes? Yeah, so we, um, you know, we measure impact in a variety of different ways. Um, if we're focusing on a program to reduce mothers who die, you know, we, we focus on the number, uh, the percentage of women who, as a result of programs, um, have safe deliveries. You know, that's an, as an example. If we're looking at malnutrition in children, we're lo we look at the number of children who are no longer malnourished as a result of the work that we do. So, you know, it depends on, on what the programs are, what the actual impact is. But ultimately, what we want to measure are communities, in fact, um, beginning to develop self-sufficiency. Are there more people who are no longer living at the um, extreme levels of poverty and be able to measure that over time? You know, as opposed to in earlier days, you know, we would look at our work as short-term projects. Did you build a few wells? Did you s develop a few schools? Now we look at much more long-term horizons. You know, here's a population that we're focused on, and can we, after five years, ten years, see a measurable difference in their health, in their education, in their economic welfare? So really looking, looking much more long-term at that. 
We actively try to, as we call it, kind of graduate countries that we're working in. And so, you know, um, there are countries like Thailand, like India, like uh, Peru, um, Brazil, and others that used to be countries that were managed as, uh, as country offices by care that are now independent entities themselves. And so we're, you know, we're really proud when a country that used to be kind of an aid recipient and where we used to you know, operate and oversee those programs, where they now become independent programs. And that's a real measure for us when we start seeing that. And that's something that we're seeing more and more, particularly in the, in the middle income countries, where they now become national members themselves. They're doing the work themselves and they have kind of moved on to the next phase. An interesting example is the Philippines. The Philippines was a country that we were in for many, many years and um, you know we were able to move out of that country. The Philippines became a you know an independent um, country that was an uh, independent entity that was operating. And when the Philippines, uh, in the, when the typhoon hit, uh, we went back and supported the Philippines, but we supported the work that they were doing, not having to come in and do the work for them. So that's the kind of thing that we think is really, um, you know, incredibly encouraging that shows that, in fact, um, countries do move on. And, you know, not so much uh, care, but when we think about countries like South Korea, for instance, that used to be a major aid recipient that is now a donor nation itself. So we know that it happens, and we know that there are fewer people living in poverty today, not only because of our efforts, but because of the, the kinds of work that we and others have done. No, it's great. And just following on that, it seems like a lot of the groundwork is laid by the activities of organizations like CARE that help countries move from, as you said, recipients to emerging markets. Exactly. Right. Where corporations and individuals are investing and seeing very strong economic returns, particularly when you look at a Brazil or an India. And right. So. Right. So, yeah. so the business community actually has a, a great debt <laughs> to organizations like CARE in terms of improving living standards right. and things of that nature. Can you talk to us about what the United States government's role is in eradicating poverty, extreme poverty right well, now? Well, you know, the U.S. government uh, through the Agency for International Development is a major funder, in fact, the, the, the largest funder of foreign assistance around the world. It's the largest funder because we have the largest economy, but if you look at our percentage of what we give relative to countries, particularly in northern, uh, northern European countries, you know, we give a much lower percentage. But the U.S. government is a, uh, is a, larger, uh, uh, a large funder of foreign assistance. Um, the U.S. government provides resources to care and organizations like care and does a lot um, in health, in agriculture, in education, and in a lot of different areas to provide support um, for countries around the world. And um, you've recently expanded work into new countries. Um, is there a, a new country that you're very excited to be working in? And where do you hope to expand next and why? Well, we really aren't expanding to a lot of countries. Um, you know, we're, uh, most of the countries that we've been in, we've been in for decades, mm -hmm. and we're continuing to deepen our work in the countries that we're in, and hopefully trying to get out of more countries, not go get into more countries. So, you know, I think um, we're doing less expanding, uh, more looking at, you know, ways of continuing to evolve the work in the countries that we're doing. You know, but as I mentioned before, I think some of the things that I'm really excited about are the kind of programs that build different kinds of partnerships with different sectors um, and looking at new and different ways of evolving the kind of work that we do. Um, can we talk a little bit about those partnerships? I mean, are there some specifics that come to mind that you well, like some, to see more? Yeah, some of the things, as I was mentioned before, that I think are kind of neat. Um, you know, in, in, in the past, organizations like CARE tended to partner more with other NGOs. And so we would work a lot with other NGOs, either international NGOs or 
local NGOs, and we still do a lot of that. But I think sometimes where you can have the greatest leverage is by working with organizations that aren't like you. And so, as I was talking about before, a lot of our work with the private sector, for instance, is very, is, is you know, I think very innovative. You know, we're working with um, major agriculture companies, for instance, who uh, recognize that they can actually not only source locally for some of their products, like cocoa in West Africa, uh, as an example, um, where we're working with companies that produce chocolate, and their, you know, their their producers, um, oftentimes are smallholder farmers who are the who are the types of farmers that we work with. If we can help them increase their yield, those companies get a better product. Those farmers get a better income stream. Those communities all ultimately benefit. And I think we're seeing that that kind of work gives a kind of a win-win situation that helps to generate wealth, but also does it in a way that creates social good. Oh, that's fabulous. Um, this question raises the specter of technology and the internet specifically. Um, they say they are sure you can list a lot of th good things that have come from having the internet um, in development, but um, what they're most interested in is can you tell us about some of the problems that technology or the internet have created for development organizations like CARE in the field? You know, I don't know that I can really say problems. Um, you know, we all read about the problems that uh, in so some parts of the world where, you know, internet may not be as free and open. Um, but, you know, for us, the uh, technology has been a real enabler. Um, in, many, in many parts of the world that we work in, you know, take our work with village savings and loans. We work with very rural populations who save small amounts of money, pool those resources to give, to give loans. But you can imagine, um, you know, give loans to each other. They charge interest. They're able to, to use those to, to uh, start small businesses, repay themselves, and to continue to save. But as you can imagine, you know, there's a limit to how much you can save in a rural community with, in, in a wooden lockbox um, for security reasons and all, and all other sorts of reasons. But a lot of those rural populations don't have access to financial institutions. Well, if you can start using mobile technology and electronic wallets, people can start saving greater assets and they start becoming part of the formal economy as opposed to the informal economy. So, you know, um, digital technology has been a huge enabler for some of our work with financial, uh, microfinance and some of those things that have really helped people who wouldn't have been the, the unbanked be able to actually access financial institutions. It helps us a lot with rural farmers who are able to price their crops better because they're able to actually use mobile technology to understand what pricing is in the capital cities so that they can actually price and get fair prices for, for their, for their um, crops. Health workers, uh, people in rural communities who didn't have access to health and health information. You now have a rural health worker who's able to, with an SMS, text what, what symptoms are um, occurring in a woman who's about to, to deliver and get information back so that she can help that woman have a safe birth. So, you know, for us, technology has been a huge enabler and we really haven't had a lot of problems where that has, where it's been um, an obstacle to progress. Oh, that's great. And then um, the questioner also asked, what about in terms of consensus building? So, you know, you, you've shared some very technical applications for technology. Has it been useful, a la Twitter, you know, in terms of galvanizing communities, per se? Yeah, you know, there's there's been several examples. Uh, one that I think has been really innovative is how in... Um, um, situations of um, uh, violence in, and gender, particularly gender-based violence, people have come have come up with kind of a, a GPS mapping that allows people to report areas where, particularly women, are more likely to be 
uh, violated in public and to start mapping that so that people know how to build safe spaces for for women who are moving in you know um, in in areas that may be unsafe so i think there are ways in which people are starting to use that technology that builds consensus that builds you know um, different ways of of raising awareness around things like gender based violence and and other things that then people can develop a community response towards um, this next question is a little inside baseball kind of thing. <laughs> it's, it's saying, you know, it's asking, do you see CARES objectives changing in response to the shift from Millennium Development Goals to Sustainable Development Goals? So maybe if you give just a, a, yeah. a brief oversight on what's the difference? So the Millennium Development Goals were started in, in uh, 2000. The UN developed the Millennium Development Goals that were the goals that the world came together to agree upon around um, key priorities for, for reducing poverty. They were around reducing extreme poverty based on income, but also improving education, improving certain health indices, um, uh, access to clean and safe drinking water. And they were for a 15-year period of time. And there were some very specific, tangible goals that have been set. Um, and those are the goals that all of us kind of work against, you know, so how can we meet those Millennium Development Goals? Well, 2015 is about to be here, and so it's time to start thinking about, so what's the next iteration after the Millennium Development Goals? And they're now being talked about as the Sustainable Development Goals, because what's different in our minds uh, around um, the issue of poverty is that the issue of the environment and sustainability and climate is also a huge part of the overall development agenda, because we know that the issues around climate are also so so very much linked to the development agenda. So, you know, for us, we take these issues around the environment and poverty as very much intertwined, because um, poor people and poor communities are the ones that are often most affected by environmental degradation. They're also the ones that often have to live off the land um, and do that in, in ways that are not always sustainable. So a lot of our work also helps people in uh, poor communities to think about how can they also help with the environment because if you're a fisher, in a, if you're in a fishing community and you overfish, um, you're not only destroying the you know, the, the, the fish, but you're also destroying the your capacity. economic livelihood. So, you know, people who um, are in areas where um, uh, lumber and, and timber are a big part of the economic um, viability of those communities, if they're destroying the trees, they're also destroying their livelihood. So, you know, we're looking at both the, uh, not only how do we help poor people develop, but how do we make sure that that's done in a way that's environmentally sustainable too, because it's both good for the environment, mm -hmm. um, but it's also incredibly important for economic livelihoods. Um, this next question, um, you shared with us the example of how working through community in Afghanistan, you know, you were able to maneuver within the restrictions of that government. But um, this question wanted to know if you could speak more about the challenges of working in countries where the government is a bad actor in terms of human rights abuses, et cetera. The example that they wanted to know about, if you have um, some information or, or specifics about it, is Cambodia and land grabs. Yeah, um, I can't speak to Cambodia specifically, but the issue of land grabs is and and land tenure is a big issue for us. And you know, broadly, you know, this this you know, we we're a non-governmental organization, so we work um, in countries with all kinds of governments, and oftentimes, as a, as a non-governmental organization, we're often the target of bad gov of of governments that don't have their people's uh, best interest in mind because, you know, they get threatened by organizations that, you know, are, are really looking to help to develop the voice of communities. And so, you know, it, it is a challenge for us sometimes to work in countries where governments are, are either um, corrupt, uh, unstable, or unsafe 
because it also poses challenges for, for us and our staff. But, you know, as a humanitarian organization, our, you know, our first commitment is to making sure that we're doing what we can for, for um, people in need. Um, you know, that said, we always have to balance that with the safety of our own workforce. But the, the issue of land and land tenure and land and land grabs is a big is a big issue for us and, and we're trying to work in lots of communities to make sure that people do have access to the rights to their own land. And as we work with corporations, it's a big issue because there are a lot of corporations that have been accused of, you know, land grabs in, in countries that we work with. So it's part of our advocacy agenda as well to make sure that companies that are working in communities are not in a position where they're, you know, they're doing land grabs mm -hmm. and also helping communities and people to understand their own rights so that they can speak up for their own property and helping people get the rights and the, te and, and the legal rights to the property that they own so that they're not at the whims of um, either poor governments or other actors. And uh, this next question wanted to know what conflict or problems have occurred between CARE and NGOs and local and national governments um, when there's issues that say a ministry, you know, sets as a priority which is different than yours or vice versa. Um, you know, this I guess would apply to countries where there's a lot of political unrest or what's your... Well, um, Take on that. yeah, I'm not sure, yeah, uh, probably somebody had something specific in mind, but, you know, we feel like uh, as, if we're working in a, a country that has a, a solid development plan, then we don't come up with a different development plan. You know, we try to work within the framework of, of the countries in which we're working in. If, in fact, um, as the, the earlier question mentioned, you know, if, in fact, we're working in countries where the government doesn't have the best interests of its mm -hmm. people in mind, you know, it's, it's always a difficult balancing act. But, you know, we feel strongly that as, as a non-governmental organization, you know, we're there to help to support communities first and foremost, but we also hopefully will support governments, particularly governments who have strong, solid development plans. Um, the next question uh, loves your latest project in Africa to bring financial inclusion to the unbanked by leveraging technology and the private sector. Um, can you talk in more detail about that specific project, Fidelity and MTM? I, I know you talked uh, about how you see technology playing a role um, in empowering women and girls in the fight against Yeah, well, so as I said, you know, it's it's a big project. We're doing a lot with our village savings and loans, mm -hmm. in fact, to, and, and, and linking those um, through technology to get some of the um, people who didn't have access to banking into the banking system. And if whoever asked the question, I'd be happy to give more information, but that's the, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> thank, yeah, 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 thank you. Okay, and um, this next question said you mentioned education as being, you know, a critical piece in addressing poverty, uh, indispensable to alleviating poverty. Are there other sectors, issues, other um, activities that are go hand in hand with the educational piece? Well, you know, I mean, education is just is is one, and I, you know, I think it's not, uh, you know, there is no one sector. Um, you know, obviously, in many of the countries we work in, agriculture is key to the economy. So we do a lot of work in agriculture. Having people have access to clean and safe drinking water is important. Making sure that people don't die prematurely by making sure they have access to vaccinations and health care. I mean, all of these things are critical, but probably underlying all of that is helping people to understand their rights and helping governments to be responsible to its citizens. Because at the end of the day, you can do all the education you want, but if people don't have an, have an awareness of their own rights, and the ability to exercise those rights, then you know it doesn't matter what particular sector is you're working in. So we look at you know, the work that we do, whether it's ac access to water, to education, to health, economic development, as necessary but not sufficient. 
um, and really looking at how do you make sure that you take the other obstacles out, uh, addressing uh, inequality, discrimination, um, l looking at um, you know, accountability, all of these other factors are core, and there is no one sector that's, that's the key. It's how do all of those things come together in a way that allow people um, to have their basic needs met, but also to take away the other obstacles that keep people um, locked away from realizing their full potential. And, you know, it's okay to, to have a little commercial here for care in terms of, I mean, it's a holistic approach. Right. And care seems to excel at that. I mean, is that, is that a fair statement in terms of how you go about doing projects as you enter a country? Yeah, I think, you know, for us, that's the way we work. So, yeah, I mean, to be holistic, to, to really look at how do you have an integrated approach to development, um, yeah. And um, this next question asks about sports. Do you see sports in any way impacting the programs that either you're doing or other uh, having a role in the whole development we have, process? Yeah, I mean, we, we have programs, uh, sports for social change. Sports, you know, is a, uh, is a important, in many communities, is an important way of building um, self-esteem. It's a, an important way of building um, teamwork, negotiation, and all the rest of it. So we do have some programs that focus on sports as a way of building some of those sorts of, um, particularly with young women, we, sports um, can be a real way of building self-esteem in, in young women who otherwise have not had access to kind of team sports that um, can give confidence and build confidence. And uh, it wasn't one of the questions from the audience, but I was wondering, are there linkages that CARE is doing in terms of um, serving populations, you know, sort of doing transfer of knowledge and community building across national boundaries or, or borders, for example, you know, maybe working with girls in one country and facilitating their interaction with girls in another country or in the U.S.? Well, we do a lot of regional projects, uh, so looking at cross-border projects where there are things that are common to different clusters and countries. For instance, in, in the Great Lakes region of Burundi and Rwanda, Uganda, where there are high rates of gender-based violence, and we've been very involved in some um, projects that cut across the national boundaries that help to share ways in which um, looking at conflict resolution has actually helped in countries that, that, that have had a lot of conflict, and then from that conflict, um, you know, there becomes kind of a, a culture of, of violence that um, particularly has an impact on, on women. And so we've looked at some of those things that are common to those countries where that has been a big problem and use that as a way of transferring lessons learned from one country to another. You know, it's part of the, the advantage of being a global organization is that we can take lessons that we may have learned in mm -hmm. Peru that might be helpful in Mali or, you know, programs that we learn in Guatemala that may be helpful in Egypt. And I think it's part of, you know, what we think is uh, a comparative advantage of being a global organization. And, you know, in the, you've been with CARE eight years mm -hmm. now. And looking back over your tenure with CARE, are there certain milestones or highlights that, um, you know, have just made your work with the organization um, the worthwhile and wonderful experience it seems to be? Well, it's hard to say. You know, I, I um, look back and, first of all, it's hard to believe it's been eight years. <laughs> Uh, it's been a wonderful, you know, care and, and the ability to um, go out and see what a difference you can make in the life of a person, um, you know, with with a small amount of resources. Again, I use the example of the village savings and loans because I think it's one of these things that kind of um, creates so much value. And I, you know, think about um, visiting people who took out a two-dollar loan that has allowed them to totally change their life 
in ways that are remarkable. You know, people, you know, um, I can think of women who I have met who were basically prisoners in their own homes, um, not allowed to get out and couldn't make decisions. And as a result of starting to have some economic means that allow them to become contributors to their family, what a difference it makes for them, but also what a difference it makes for their family and how it starts changing the ways that communities think about them. And so those are the things that I look back and, you know, when I think about young girls who have had the access to education who didn't have that before or, um, you know, um, small holder farmers who now are helping to add to global supply chains of, you know, large corporations, you know, those are the kinds of things that you realize that you can change lives in ways that, um, you know, um, in, are simple, but um, in some ways revolutionary and uh, life-changing. That's great. And uh, I think we're closing in fairly soon um, on our, our time together. But I did want to ask you, I know you started your career as a physician, a pediatrician specifically, and you know, you've moved through these various agencies working with the CDC, um, working with um, international health organizations, and now leading this tremendous organization. Can you just talk a little bit about that experience, the evolution from working, you know, in a smaller uh, sort of area with individuals, and now here you have this global domain where you're having significant impact. Yeah, well, you know, um, I went into medicine and health because I wanted to have a career that allowed me to give back. And I always knew that I wanted to, in some ways, be a part of helping to create positive social change. Um, so for me, the migration from you know, looking at what you can do to change the life of an individual to then public health where your patient is an individual but it's a population or a community and sometimes it's an, a nation or even the world um, to, look, to moving from health as the center to looking at what are all the other factors that actually influence health because, you know, while um, you can do a lot using health interventions. If you can give people access to clean water, if you can make sure that they have an adequate um, income, if you can make sure that their children get education, in some ways you probably do more for health than if you just focus on health interventions. So, you know, for me it's just been a natural progression in some ways of being able to take what um, I learned as a physician taking care of individuals to applying that to, you know, ways in which I think in the end, if you can end poverty, you can probably have a bigger impact on improving health than focusing only on, on health itself, so. Interesting. And where do you see sort of the next push um, for care? I mean, you know, in terms of um, milestones that the organization wants to achieve? We're going to keep doing our work. We're going to keep trying to make sure that we can um, um, have fewer and fewer people have to live in extreme poverty. That's what we're committed to. And, I, you know, I think in some ways people are always thinking about doing something big, different, and new when what you need to do is to keep doing what you're doing because it makes a difference. And that's what we're going to keep doing is doing what we do because we know it makes a difference. And how can we the audience here, the audience watching, how can we support uh, what organizations like CARE is doing? I think I read somewhere in some of the research, I mean, the, your public funding, you know, at one point was 70% of your budget, and now it's gone down to about 30%. Um, public meaning, that's U.S. government funding, right. So we've, you know, we've diversified our funding where we used to be very dependent on U.S. government um, and now we're, we are diversifying to um, focus on a variety of different uh, sources of funding. Government is still a large part, 30 percent, but c corporations, foundations, and we really rely a lot on individual contributions a lot because that's where we get our more flexible funding. Uh, and so, you know, that's one way that people can write, uh, <laughs> help is write a check. Uh, you know, and, and every little bit helps. I, mean, I think oftentimes people think that it means, you know, you've got to be able to write, 
a huge uh, check to be able to make a difference. But, you know, $10 a month is enough to send a girl to school. Uh, and so, you know, if we think about the little bits of resources that it takes to make a big difference in the lives of people around the world, you know, um, and many, many contributions of a small amount adds up to make a big difference. So, you know, we, we um, encourage people to give, but we also encourage people to use their voices. And as I mentioned before, we have the Care Action Network. You can go on our website and um, sign up and be a voice for the voiceless. And it may be something as simple as writing letters to Congress people when uh, we send out alerts, or it might be going to help lobby um, in, in congressional offices here or in, in Washington. But those are the kinds of things that matter. And telling your friends about why it matters for us to care about these issues, because I think it is very important for us um, as, as uh, you know, people living in a global community to be aware of these issues and to, to be informed, because that's what you know, then helps others to make the, the right kinds of decisions that have a real impact on the kind of work we do. Yeah, and I know that on your website, uh, there's lots of statistics in terms of uh, sort of quantifying the scope of the work mm -hmm. that needs to be done with CARE, so. Yeah, www.care.org. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, all right, well, I thank you, and this concludes our program for this evening. And on behalf of the World Affairs Council, I ask you to join me in thanking Dr. Helene Gale for this excellent discussion. And thanks to you as well, the audience, for your terrific questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.